All right. All right. Good. Happy Sunday, July the 26th, 2020. Uh, good to be here live today, live streaming Facebook, our Sunday service today, next week. We're going to be live streaming again next week, but we will also be meeting in our sanctuary again. So for anyone that can join us at Deerbrook Baptist Church, uh, 400 East Main Street in Humble, Texas next week, we would love to have you in the sanctuary with us. Uh, we will be careful. We will social distance, uh, recommending that people wear masks when they come, but I will not police that. I'll leave that up to the people that attend. Obviously, I will be preaching without a mask. But um, <clears throat> good to see everybody joining in. See many people signed on. Like I was just announcing, uh, next Sunday we will be in the sanctuary, but we will always live stream like we have been doing for several months now. So both will be available. <clears throat> um, at the end of this meeting uh, message today, <clears throat> at the close of it, we will be um, celebrating a virtual Lord's Supper. So anyone that can participate with us We'll be able to do that, uh, but you'll, we're going to tie that um, celebration of the Lord's Supper to, uh, it'll tie well with what we're going to talk about today, because today we're going to talk about <clears throat> the understanding the marriage supper of the Lamb, what that's all about, and, and uh, why it was set up, why it was initiated, and not only that, we're going to see when we look at Scripture how the whole Bible was showing us it was being built towards that celebration time. So uh, very exciting to see the connection throughout Scripture. <clears throat> you know, the Bible was written over 4,000 years by over 40 different authors. Uh, and those people were actually on three different continents when, the, when it was written. So uh, they weren't even alive during the same time, could not have possibly known each other, but the same God spoke through them. The Word of God is inspired by Him, and that's why there are no errors in it, and that's why... The story continues, and that's why it builds up the way that it does. <clears throat> so it's exciting to read the Bible. Good to know that God wrote it for people like me, people like you. <clears throat> we don't follow God because we're good. We follow God because He is good. Uh, I've made so many mistakes in my life, uh, and I thank God that He has not made a single one in our lives. So He's good. So we get up. Solomon said a wise man falls seven times, but he gets up. Amen. So we get up. We press forward. And we go back to serving God, and we're thankful for that. So we're going to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb today. We want to understand that. We want to see what the Bible teaches about it. We want to see the excitement. We want to see, um, <clears throat> we don't know when it's going to happen. We know it's coming soon. In fact, the Bible tells us that in such an hour, you think not. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes, and we'll see how that connects to why and how that connects to the marriage celebration uh, from the Old Testament, <clears throat> what was going on in the time of Christ, and how that correlated with other scriptures. So the marriage supper of the Lamb. Our text we're going to start with is in Revelation chapter 19. So if you have a Bible and you want to go there, I'll give you a minute to find Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> in that chapter, we're going to start with verse 7. Revelation 19, 19 pardon me, 19 verse 7 the marriage supper of the Lamb. <clears throat> While people are finding that text, I'll, for those of you who just signed on, I'll make the announcement again next week. Our sanctuary will be open starting next Sunday morning. So we'll have services in the sanctuary for those of you who can attend. I'll ask that you, did, uh, I'll, I'll suggest people wear uh, a mask, but I'll not police it. I'll leave that up to each one's own discretion. Uh, but we will be in the sanctuary, but no worries. We will also be on streaming live on Facebook. Let me also say that uh, messages that have been on Facebook uh, have been also being put on YouTube. So uh, I think you can, uh, I don't even remember the YouTube address, but I think you can look us up by DBC Humble or Deerbrook Baptist Church if you go to YouTube or you want to point someone else to it. But they're not live there. They're pre-recorded. They're the previous ones. So but they can find us there too for people that are not on Facebook. But we're in Revelation, we're in chapter 19 today, and we're in verse 7. And we're going to talk about understanding the marriage supper of the Lamb. What is that all about? It says in verse 7, <clears throat> Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. 
Now, the writer of Revelation here, John, is being inspired by the Spirit, and, and after showing us through Revelation, the first four chapters talk about uh, what was present then in his day and what's present in our day. This is the time in Revelation prior to the rapture of the church. We're going to refer to that again in a few minutes. Uh, at, at the end of chapter 4, beginning chapter 5, we see the church out of the picture. We see the Bible continue for several chapters to focus on events in the world. And in those events in the world, we see a focus on a tribulation period for, for three and a half years. Then we see it focus on the great tribulation period, the second three and a half years for a total of seven. And during those times, we see events on earth, but we don't see the church on earth. In the Bible, the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, and the Bible tells us Jesus is coming back for a spotless bride, one without wrinkle, one without spot. And we'll make reference to that again also. But uh, then we see the Bible turn its attention in Revelation after the, that towards heaven, and we start to see events in heaven. And when we see events in heaven, we come to this part right here in chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 19, one of the events in heaven, we see where it talks about verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice for, and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Now this is happening in heaven, and it says, has come. So the, the scene is in heaven, so we know now, even from this one verse, that the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to take place in heaven. That's where it's happening. Now, <clears throat> what we need to fill our minds in on is a little bit about the, the Jewish marriage and about weddings and uh, uh, Galilean weddings and those kind of things and how the Jews did this. And we can find some really nice, beautiful pictures throughout Scripture in the correlation of, of what's going on and why this is exciting. Now, let's go back, if you will, all right? Let's go back in our Bibles. You want a whole Revelation 19, but let's go back in our Bibles all the way back to the Gospels, and let's look at the Gospel of Luke for just a minute. Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to go to chapter 22 in Luke. Now, when we get to, uh, in, in Luke, we're going to be in verse 15, Luke 15, uh, 22, 15. So in Revelation 19, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. All right. This is going to be a time when there will be a wedding feast, as you and I know from Scripture. This is when the, the, the bride and the groom will actually come together. Now, something important to understand, in the, in the, the Galilean weddings and the, the Hebrew weddings, there was three phases, three phases of that wedding. Not surprising that the number three comes up, but there were three phases. The first was they were betrothed to be married, okay? Uh, we see that in, in the life of uh, Joseph and Mary. It even mentions the word. So the, they're actually considered husband and wife that day when they're betrothed. Okay, that is when the father selects a bride for his son and he pays a dowry. He pays a price and that price is accepted. You and I uh, become the bride of Christ with the payment that God made to redeem us, and that payment was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. That Lamb is, is all that he required to purchase us with. Hosea paints a picture of uh, the nation of Israel, which is an image, a spiritual image also. The nation of Israel had gone harlotting, and they left their first love. But Hosea goes as a figure of God, and he pays a price for a harlot bride and redeems her publicly. And they're, they're publicly uh, in auction, if you will, or if, if you're willing to pay, you could go in public square and you could purchase the bride back. And Hosea went publicly and paid a price to purchase um, a harlot, uh, Gomer, his bride back. Jesus Christ paid the price publicly on a cross to purchase us. That was God paying for us to redeem us back. So there, when they become husband and wife, step one, they were betrothed. Now, the next thing that happened is what's going on today. All right, so Christ paid for the church, and now we're living in that phase where we're waiting on step two. Step two, first was that they were betrothed to be married. They were considered legally married. But then secondly, uh, the next thing that would happen is the father was setting up a feast for the marriage celebration. So you're betrothed, but you hadn't celebrated it yet. The celebration needed to take place before the two of them could permanently live together. 
and they would do so at the, in the father's house. But they could not do that until um, that celebration took place. Now, the bigger the celebration would be, the longer that that period of time between that betroth being betrothed and that marriage feast. The bigger the celebration, the longer the wait. We've been waiting for 2,000, over 2,000 years for uh, the father to send the son to get his bride and say the celebration's ready. So he's been preparing this for 2,000 years. So imagine just how great of a celebration we're in for when we get to the father's house. He's gonna call the bride home. To do that, the, there was the Galilean wedding had a specific way of doing it. So once the, 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 the bride is uh, accepted, the, he, she's paid for and she's accepted the proposal, then uh, she's been invited and she accepts him as her husband, she then begins to wait. From that moment on, she waits because what happens next is the bridegroom goes back to the father's house and with the father, they begin to make preparations for a feast. Now, she don't know when he's coming back. In fact, the son don't know when he's coming back because the son has to wait on the father's instructions because the father is going to let the son know how much effort he's willing to put into the celebration. That's why the son don't know. It's not that the father don't want the son to know, but the father is doing this on behalf of the bride and the bridegroom. So he's putting a lot of effort into this celebration. And the, the bridegroom is just saying, well, wow, this is fantastic. Is it ready now? And the father says, no, I want to give you more. I want to give you a bigger celebration. That's why the bridegroom don't know the day or the hour because he don't know how much this, how big of a celebration the father has in store for both of them. So the bridegroom begins to wait. Uh, I mean, the bride begins to wait on the bridegroom. Now, what does she do during that time? Well, because she don't know the day or the hour, she begins to make herself ready. She begins to, she gets the dress and she begins to prepare herself in fact, there's some historical documents that will say that when a young brides in, in Galilee were selected and accepted a proposal, many of them would put on their wedding dress that day and not take it off. They would stay dressed. And they even had people to help them, maidens to help them so that they wouldn't wrinkle the dress. So they would look their best when the bridegroom would come. So there's a waiting period. There's a betrothed, step one. Then number two, when that celebration feast is ready, the father tells the son, go get your bride. It's time for the celebration. Now, we know that's what's going to happen next. That's the rapture of the church. The father, God, is going to tell Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, go get your bride, the church. Now, when he does that, there's a little bit of an interesting piece that takes place because the bridegroom leaves the father's house at that time, but he don't go back to the, to the bride's house. See, Jesus came to this world and he walked among us, but he's, he's, when he calls the, the, for the celebration, he's not going to come back and physically walk here. What he's going to do, the bridegroom would go with a party. He would go to the outside of her city. So if she's in Jerusalem, he would go to the, to the outside of Jerusalem, to the, to the outside of the city, and there would be a sound of a trumpet. And that trumpet would awaken the whole city. It would awaken everybody that knew that there was going to be a celebration. So the trumpet would sound and people would say, oh, the wedding's going to be today. And everybody would hurry themselves up because they were all invited. Everybody was invited to go to the, to the marriage celebration. Those that cared to would go. So they would, when they heard the trumpet, people would hurry and get ready because he wasn't saying that you can come to the celebration and I'll give you eight hours or I'll give you six weeks. He was saying, it's now, now's the time. I'm blowing the trumpet. It's time to go now. And here's what would happen. He would, by blowing that trumpet, he would call the bride out of the city and she would meet him out of the city and they would go back to the father's house. That's a picture of the rapture. Here's what happens. We wait today on the trumpet of God to sound. And when the trumpet sounds, Jesus is not gonna physically walk to earth He's going to sound a trumpet and we will meet him in the air, the Bible says. He will call us out of this city, this world we live in. And from that point where we meet him in the clouds, he will take us then to the father's house. He will escort us at that point. And we will go back to the father's house for the marriage celebration. All right, that's good stuff. All right, book of Luke chapter 22. If you want to look there with me, Luke 22. 
We're going to go to verse 15. Now, in, in Luke, we're going to pause for a moment, and I want you, it's going to feel like we're talking about two different things, but, and we are in some ways, but we're talking about one celebration when we look at the whole picture. Because in Luke twenty two fifteen, 15, I'll start in verse 14. It says, when the hour had come, he sat down with his 12 apostles with him. Now, Jesus at this point in Luke 22 is, is with his disciples physically on the earth. And this is the last Passover. Now, the Passover meal, you and I know, was celebrated by the Jewish people going way back because when they were freed from slavery in Egypt, they, uh, they came out of there quickly with the sacrifice of a lamb, and forever they celebrate their deliverance uh, from slavery, from, and you and I, from sin. So he's about to eat the last celebration Passover before his crucifixion, all right? In verse 15, he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he's had a lot of Passovers. He's kept the Passover. He's about 33 years old. He's been doing this. But he says, this one's special. There's something different about this one. He says, with fervent desire, I have, I have desired to eat this, this Passover, this one. I'm excited about it with you before I suffer. So it wasn't just the Passover celebration. The reason he's talking about this one, and that's why he focused on saying this one, and that's why it was recorded in Scripture, it didn't record all the other ones Jesus ate with the disciples. You know, you hear mention of it here and there, but this one gets focused on because this one's different. Why? He says, before I suffer, before his crucifixion. Look at verse 16. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he's saying, I'm excited about this one because this is the last one. And I get to tell you something. I get to teach you now. I'm going to be leaving, all right? And in me leaving, now I want to help you draw a connection between what we're doing right here and what we're going to do in the kingdom of God. There's a connection, and I want you to see the connection. That's what he's telling them. Verse uh, 17, he then took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So once again, he said, I will not eat of this again until we're in the kingdom. Then he said, I will not drink this with you again until we're in the kingdom. Now, what is he saying? He said, this is the last one I'll physically have with you, but he didn't say this is the last one we'll have together. He said, we're going to do this again. Notice, until is the word that he used, until. So twice he said, this is the last time here. But then he also said, we're going to do it again because he said, but when we do it again, it's going to be in the kingdom of God. So we have a celebration here. So the Passover of the Old Testament certainly, certainly recognized Israel's deliverance from, from Pharaoh in Egypt as they were set free from being slaves. But it did more than just give the Old Testament Israel a picture of freedom from slavery. In fact, what Israel missed and still misses today, we find a fulfillment of in the New Testament and in the kingdom of God. What we find is the real image of the Passover had nothing to do with leaving Egypt. The real image had something to do with the bride and the groom in heaven. Because when is it going to happen again? Jesus said, when I share it with you in heaven. Let's do this. Now, you got that picture in, in Luke 22, all right? We, we've got the image. There's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. All right, we got it, Revelation 17. We also have Luke 22, we have the Jesus' own words saying, we're going to celebrate this together again in the kingdom of God. Got it? Now, the next thing I want you to see, we're going to look at in two, probably two more passages. So look with me, if you will, in the book of John. Find the book of John, find chapter 2. All right, John chapter 2. Now, if you are the Messiah, uh, imagine your, your thoughts. You, here's Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's going to, he's God. He's Emmanuel. And he comes to earth and he reveals the Father. In fact, Jesus said, I've been with you so long and you don't know me. 
Well, when he said those things, he was saying to the disciples, you should know who I am. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You should know I'm not just a man that I'm God. You should understand that, that I'm the son I just came from God. I'm the son of God. In John chapter 2, we find Jesus on the scenes here, and he performs a miracle. Now, if you're the Messiah, and you're in the world, and you want to manifest God to the world, and you're going to do that by performing a miracle, what, what miracle are you going to perform? When we think about the most miraculous things we can envision, the first thing we think about is raise somebody from the dead. And he did that, right? So that would be the, probably the most miraculous thing the human eye could see, but that isn't what he chose to do first. The very first miracle of Jesus had nothing to do with physical death. It had nothing to do with all of that. Instead, it had something to do with turning water into wine. And this happened at a marriage celebration at Cana. So the very first thing Jesus did, miraculous-wise, was reveal to us the very last thing that the Bible talks about being the marriage supper of the Lamb. So Jesus begins his public ministry with a manifestation of the goal of his public ministry, and that is to get a bride to celebrate with him in the Father's house. We're in John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I'm going to pause. In the Bible, you read a lot, and we being people tend to focus on the wrong things when we, when we read things. <coughs> we find the word wine used a lot. Now, wine is used in Scripture as a symbol of a happy time of celebration. The Bible's never uh, insinuating that people should uh, become intoxicated. That's not the point at all. It's rather that people understand that this, this is a celebration, all right? But wine was really a symbolized, it was really a picture of a sacrificial blood. So the wine in and of itself was really an image. And when there's two kinds of wine in the Bible, old wine and new wine, we know that. And Jesus always drank new wine. You, you can even see that in this text, which would have been unfermented, but we're not preaching on that today. So he's at a celebration, and the celebration has their sharing happiness. They're sharing joy. And we could substitute that word. They're out of joy. They're out of the thing which they celebrate, or, or their celebration is over. They have nothing more to celebrate. They have no wine. Verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Isn't that a pretty interesting comment? Too easy to read past that comment. The only way that comment makes sense is if we can learn to connect that hour with something else in the Bible. If, we if he would have just said, what does your concern have to do with me? And stopped. Okay, the whole statement is fitting to that scenario at a wedding. But it wasn't intended to fit that scenario at a wedding because he said, my hour's not yet come. So the focus here then in his words before doing the miracle was on, okay, he's, what he's fixing to do has something to do with the hour that has not yet come. What is that hour? We just read in Luke 22 that Jesus said, I'll no longer drink this with you until we do this in the kingdom of heaven. You and I know that in the kingdom of heaven, when we get there and we, we drink the symbolic, when we drink the wine with Christ, then it's going to be the marriage celebration. So what Jesus was saying, the hour of my honor as a bridegroom has not yet come. The time of my feast with my bride has not yet come. This is somebody else's celebration. I'm at somebody else's wedding. And you're, what I want you to understand is my time of celebration has not yet come. So what does this have to do with me? Why are you wanting me to fix a celebration in this world when that's not why I'm here? I didn't come to give people a reason to celebrate in this world. I come so that people would have a reason to come celebrate with me in the Father's house. 
Can you see all of that information shared through a simple statement that Jesus made when he said, my hour is not yet come? See, the word of God is so powerful and only God could put all that stuff together. Verse five, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, what we have next is we have his mother, Jesus said, my hour is not yet come. So his mother looks at him and says, don't know what he meant by that, guys, but I trust whatever he says. You know, there's so much of the scripture you may read. There's so many things that you may not quite understand. We may not, we may not understand why God isn't doing one thing in this world or why God is doing something different. But we can take the, the words of Mary and just whatever he said, just do it. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to debate it. Whatever God said, just do that. Just do it because he knows what he's talking about. Verse 6. Now, there were, there were set there six water pots of stone. Listen to this. Okay, so they need wine, she tells Jesus. So she knows he's got power. We know Jesus has power, so we go to him. But we go to him with our own request. Please help, help us. Give, give us a reason to celebrate, Lord. Make this celebration work. Give us something to celebrate with. And he says, you got, you got the whole idea of celebrating backwards, right? But it says there were six water pots over there. Now, the, the number six, I'm not going to get deep into this, but the number six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day, all right? So by way of worldly interpretation, they have six water pots there. So man's ideas of celebration are present, now, it says something else about those water pots of stone. It says, according to the purification of the Jews. According to the purification of the Jews. So there were water pots, and the Jews went through very important purification rituals. When a priest would go into the temple, he would take water from those water pots, and he would wash himself thoroughly before he would go into the temple. Now, this was a symbol to them, and it's a symbol to us, that unless you've been made clean, you have no business in the presence of God. You cannot come into the temple of God. We will not be in the kingdom of God unless we have been washed and made white. So there's a symbol there, all right? But there were other times when the priest would just wash their hands. The disciples would just wash their hands before they put something in their body. Symbolically, whatever I touch must be clean or it should not be part of my life. The Pharisees asked Jesus, why do your disciples eat without washing their hands? Jesus made it clear that that was symbolic and it did not physically make them clean. So back to the text. So there were water pots. Verse seven, Jesus said, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. Now, why didn't the water pots already have water in them? The water pots were there for the purification, according to the purification rituals of the Jews, but they were empty. Why? Good question. I'm glad you asked. If you read the Old Testament, you find that the Jews were very adamant about making sure that the water in those pots did not come from the earth. It didn't come from the ground because that was already tainted. That water was already impure. It had some impurities mixed with it. So they would catch rainwater, water from heaven, so that whatever was put in those pots to make them clean came from God because only God can make us clean. So the water pots, though, have nothing in them. They're empty. So Jesus says this, go ahead and fill them up. So now he's going to let them take water natural water from the earth and put it in the pots because Christ can make me clean no matter what's put in my life. It makes no different what's inside of me. He can change my life, but he's going to do something different. It says this, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up. Verse eight, he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it to him and the master of the feast had tasted the water that it was made wine. So Jesus, they put the water in there, but it was no longer water. Suddenly what was in there, something from the earth is put in the pots, but Jesus took that water and converted it to something different. 
Remember I mentioned a few minutes ago, wine was the image of celebration. So whenever the Lord works in our life, what he puts in us is cause for celebration. It gives us the ability to celebrate. Verse 10, I'm going to skip down. He, well, let me, let me finish. Let me finish now. And he uh, did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. So the master of the feast called the bridegroom. So the one in charge of this says, hold on a second. I, I've got a question. I don't know where this came from, but where, where'd you get this wine? He knew that they were out of wine. The master of the feast knew they ran out. You see, whenever you and I put our wisdom and our focus and we start to look at life, you and I know that anything in this world we celebrate has an end. The master of the celebration knew that his celebration was limited to time. It was limited to resources. It was limited to what he had. He didn't understand how we could continue to celebrate beyond what we could put into something. He didn't understand that a miracle could, from God can make give us reason and the ability to celebrate without end. So he didn't know where it came from, but they knew. Verse 10, he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. This is what it's all about. I want you to get this because this is the whole reason we came to, to John chapter two because we're talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is an image of it. So the master said, you know, here's the normal procedure. You give the best first, because if, if people are drinking wine, once they're used to it, then they'll accept whatever else you have. You know, the important thing is before people get full, make sure that they you get the good stuff out there, right? You don't give leftovers and let them get full on that and then never get to taste the good thing. So why did you do the opposite? Now, Jesus knew that they were going to run out of wine. He's invited there. Jesus could have gone into this set wedding and said, y'all dump that wine out and let me give you something better. And we could have drawn analogies off of that, but he did this for a reason. All right. Here's the thing. He's saying anything you celebrate in this world is subpar. It is nothing like the celebration that God has in store for you. The, the good celebration, the good wine, the good celebration will take place in the Father's house. So you think you've got cause to celebrate now, wait. See, the war, this master says, you know, this is backwards. Why is the good celebration after the bad celebration? Jesus is saying that's how life is built. The good celebration's coming. This is not the good celebration. All right? Now, I, I read some scripture to you a minute ago to help you fit all this together. There's coming the marriage celebration. We read it in Revelation 17, 9. We're going back there in a few minutes. So in Revelation 17, the rejoice for the marriage, celebra marriage of the Lamb has come. That's what we look forward to. We're waiting. The bride of Christ is waiting for the trumpet, for the sun to come just outside the city, not walk where we are, but just outside the city, sound the trumpet. We'll go meet him there. He'll lead us back to the Father's house. We're waiting on that, right? We've got to make ourselves ready. When we get there, that's when the good celebration will take place. That's when the real one takes place. It says in verse 11 of John 2, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. You've got to get this. You've got to get this. Listen close. Everything Jesus does is amazing. We can all agree on that. But everything Jesus did had dual purpose. It says in this verse, 11, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, now comma, listen to this, and manifested his glory. So we've got two things mentioned, two things mentioned. When Jesus performs miracles, he did it for two reasons. This tells us why. One was to manifest his glory, to make it known that he really was come from, that he really did come from God, that he really was who he said he was. There's no way, even, even the church said, there's no way that he can be from man seeing how all the miracles that he does. So he manifests his, his power. He manifests that he came from God through miracles. But there's another reason he did miracles, and he just told us why. It says, this beginning 
In other words, this is not the only miracle I do that is a sign of something else. This is the first one I do that is a sign of something else. So the second reason G Jesus did miracles was because they were a sign of something else. Amen? All right. Now, we got to go to Matthew 25 because we're connecting a lot of things. So get your Bibles over there, Matthew chapter 25. We're talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're not going to lose our focus. We're, you can chase rabbits if you're not careful because you can get honed in on what one of these texts are about. But we got to put them all together because putting them all together is it gives us an understanding of why Revelation 17 is so phenomenal. Okay, so Matthew 25, if you'll go there with me. It says in verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. I'll pause. That verse says the whole thing in a, in a, in a simple paragraph. It gives us the whole picture of what we just talked about in, in, in one paragraph. Notice this. What is the kingdom of heaven like? So the kingdom of heaven is like a marriage. It's like a marriage. And the bride is the virgin, okay? She's kept herself pure. She's devoted to the bridegroom. But notice this. It says, it's like 10 virgins who took their lamps. They carried their little lamps. I wish I had mine. I'd, I'd hold it up here because I have one. I ordered it not long ago and it's in a case in our living room. But they took their oil lamps. Now the oil lamps were small. Why? because they had to walk around with them. They weren't big lamps, so they were very small, because how are you gonna carry something, uh, five gallons full of liquid in a lamp and keep the light going and carry all that weight? Plus, you gotta hurry around with it. So their lamps were small. So when they carried these small lamps, they only held a certain amount of oil. So they carried extra oil with them. So it says here that 10 virgins took their lamps. Why would they take their lamps? Because what's happening, you're going to see in the chapter, is they're waiting for the bridegroom to, sell, to say it's time for the marriage feast, the marriage supper. They're waiting. So they're waiting, and what we have in verse 1 is the, the trumpet sounds, and the, these virgins know, okay, it's time for the supper. So they got their lamp and they went out there. And the reason they had to have a lamp, because it's going to happen in such an hour when you think not. It's dark. In a dark world, only those who carry the light of Christ will actually meet him in the air. Good picture, right? There's more. So we also see the bridegroom not come into their house. He knocked on their heart's door before. He invited them and proposed to them already. They've already accepted that. So the betrothal period is taking place. What's happening now is at the end of the betrothal period, it's actually time for the wedding ceremony. So now he sounds the trumpet, but he does that on the outskirts of town, and it's their job to meet him out there. Christ is going to call us, and we will meet him in the air. So to go meet him on the outside of the city, they had to have their lamp and they had to have oil in it so they could see because they're in a dark world. It's dark. They've got to be able to see to get out there to him. Thank God he's given us the light so that we can see Christ and we will be able to meet him in the air. Now, it says that some of these, and people try to make this into, well, you see, you can run out of the Holy Spirit, but that's not the indication here at all. Um, but let's stay on point. It says five of them were wise and five were foolish, verse two. Verse three says, those who were wise took their lamp, uh, those who were foolish took their lamps and they took no oil. So complacency, slack. So they, they were excited about the wedding. They were looking forward to it, but they thought, you know, it's not gonna happen in the dark. I don't really need that. I've got enough, this'll do. It's kind of this, yeah, I wanna be the bride and I wanna go to the celebration, but it's not that important to me. And it's this complacent mindset about not being ready when Christ comes back. Verse four, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So the wise ones knew that there is nothing going to stop me from being ready when that trumpet sounds. When he's on the outskirts of the city and he calls me to meet him so he can take me to the father's house, there is nothing more important to me than being ready for that. So not only do I have a lamp, not only am I, am I ready to go uh, with this light, 
but it's so important to me. This is top priority, and I'm going to make sure that I'm ready without any doubt. Verse 5, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So now they've got everything ready. We're backing up now in the story, okay? He's kind of told the story, and now he's backing up. So while the bridegroom was delayed, the betrothal period, none of us know the day or the hour that the trumpet's going to sound, just like the bride didn't know the day or the hour the trumpets would sound because, I mentioned it earlier, because even the bridegroom didn't know because the father's the one who paid for the celebration and prepared the celebration, and only he knew how much effort he was putting into it. So the son waited for the father to say, okay, now it's ready, go get her. So the son would go get her. She didn't know how long it was going to take, but the good news was the longer it took, the better the celebration. So while he's delayed, while the celebration's being built up, it says in this verse that they all slumbered and slept. So there came a point when, you know, I'm tired and the physical things of life are going to bring us down. The things in life, are, we're going to get tired. We, we know that, that life is not easy, but that's okay. That's okay. The Lord knows we're human. The disciples fell asleep while he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? And that's why he said, what, you couldn't even pray with me an hour? One hour? What a cool reference to the fact that we're going to have to be awake much longer than an hour for waiting on the bridegroom to come back. But he was drawing a correlation between that little time praying for him to suffer and the long time praying for him to come back and get us. Now, it says in verse 6, and at midnight a cry was heard. There's that cry. I told you earlier, that's how the weddings were done. The betrothal period on the outside of the city, trumpet sound, midnight cry, come out here and meet us. So at midnight, a, cry, a, 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 a sound was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. So the very first thing when this happened, the, the, they run out there to meet him. Now let's go all the way back there in our Bibles again to Revelation chapter 17. We've got a little bit of wedding history. We've got a, a lot of spiritual uh, cross-reference and input. So it says here in Revelation 17, uh, 19, sorry folks, Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. In Revelation, I mean, in Matthew 25, the wise bride was, had made herself ready. She was excited. She had her lamp, she had her oil, and she was adorned in her wedding gown. She would, she'd made herself ready. Right now, Jesus is not slack concerning his slack, concerning his promises. Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 3. He said, people will say, where's the promise of Jesus coming? Y'all been saying Jesus was coming back. Where is he? Why isn't he back? People been saying that. Oh, it's not the end of the world. And people are going to continue to say that kind of stuff. But don't get frustrated because it's taken so long. Get excited because it's taken so long. Because the longer the delay, the bigger the celebration. So she's made herself ready. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Revelation 19, verse eight. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So now we see her adorned in all the things, pay attention to this, what is she adorned in? The righteous acts of the saints. So don't run off and chase a rabbit with that. She is adorned in all the wonderful things that she let God do through her life. See, when you and I stand before God, we're going to be able to stand before God with a life that, can, that is only clothed with the things we let God do through our life. We're not going to stand before God and say, yeah, I, I built a library you know, in, in Zimbabwe for, for people, or I built a school, or, you know, I paid for that hospital. Well, those things are good. Those are acts of the good Samaritan. Those things are important, but you're not going to be adorned in that. You're not going to be clothed before God in the, the things, the social acts of the world. The things that we're going to be adorned before God in are the, the things that we let God do through our lives. All the righteous acts of the saints. Verse nine, then he said to me, write, Blessed are those 
Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I told you there were three things that, were, that, that we want to talk about, uh, three steps in this wedding process. The first was they were betrothed. Okay, This is when the father would choose a bride and he would pay a price, a dowry. He would pay a price for the bride. She would accept the proposal. Okay, So she officially became a legal bride. Now, that could be enough. Is that enough? Yeah, that's enough. We're officially the bride of Christ. So why wait? Well, the reason we wait is because God, after he saves us, wants to prepare a celebration for us. He wants to make our, com our homecoming special. He don't just want us to come into heaven. He wants us to come into heaven and celebrate. So to celebrate, he's taken time to build up a feast. So we're waiting on his return so he can prepare a place. Didn't Jesus say that? In my father's house are many mansions, many places to dwell. If it were not so, I would have told you. If I go and prepare a place, I'll come again outside the city, sound a trumpet, you'll meet me in the air, and bring you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. So you'll also be able to, bride of Christ, live for eternity in the Father's house with the bridegroom. It says, oh, let me go back to my point. So the, they were betrothed. The second phase is when he came back to get her. All right, so they betrothed. Step one, she accepts a proposal. Then there's a waiting period. While she's waiting, she's to keep herself prepared, and she don't know the day or the hour when he's coming back, but she waits. In such an hour, you think not, because he's in a far country, and daylight hours and nighttime hours are not the same. So it may be dark here and light there. You never know. So she just waits. But then the second step is when they come together, when he calls her to come to the Father's house. That's the rapture of the church. Step one, we get saved. Step two, we're raptured by Jesus Christ. We're called to meet him in the air. Third step, so the second step, the bridegroom would call the bride to meet him and bring her back to his father's house. And the bridegroom would physically go bring her back to his father's house. Step three was a celebration at the father's house, and it was a feast celebration. Now, I told you early on, Jesus said, uh, we were reading it a while ago in Luke chapter 22, Jesus is with his disciples. And when he's sitting with his disciples, he said in Luke twenty two fifteen, 15, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, now let me pause, before I suffer. Mention suffer because he's about to be crucified. It was important that he was crucified because he's the dowry. He's the price to, to redeem the bride. There is no bride of Christ if there is not a payment for the bride who is to be offered. So he had to suffer to pay the price to buy us, to purchase us, because we're his purchased possession. Verse 16, Luke uh, 22, for I say unto you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is the last one here, guys, but it's not the last one. We're gonna do this again. The next time it's gonna be a celebration like you've never experienced before. Verse 17, he then took the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Verse 18, Luke 22, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until, until, this is the last time we drink this together, but it's not the last time we drink it together, period. It's the last time here. We're gonna do this again. What did they drink from? The cup of the vine, the fruit, the celebration. This is our last celebration here because I'm leaving, because where I'm going is to prepare a place for you, and we're gonna celebrate together in the kingdom of God. So the marriage supper of the Lamb is when the bride of Jesus Christ meets him in the air and is brought back to heaven to the Father's house for a celebration like no other. But you gotta you gotta accept that invitation. You can't be you cannot be part of the celebration if you're not the bride of Jesus Christ. To be the bride, you have to accept his proposal. What is his proposal? His proposal is I've died for you, 
I love you. And I want to come back and bring you to my father's house. And I want you to spend eternity with me. But you have to accept that proposal. You have to be willing to give your the rest of your life to the bridegroom as the bride of Jesus Christ. Don't call yourself the bride of Christ if you're not going to live committed to the bridegroom. Too many people want to be the bride, but they want to be a harlot bride, as Hosea talked about. They want God to, 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 to be their, 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 their bridegroom. They want Jesus to be their bridegroom, but they don't want to be committed to Jesus. Well, you don't really want Jesus to be your bridegroom. You can see the imagery. He's coming back for a spotless bride. Have you given your life to Jesus? This is all about that, but praise God, it's going to be good. Now, what we're going to do as we've shared that, for those of you that can, uh, some have gone to the, by the church and picked up some Lord's Supper um, communion cups and things like that, some of the disposals, disposables. So if you have those, then you can take obviously take part in, in we're going to go ahead and do this. It's a good time to, to celebrate that. Why not celebrate it right now? We'll do it virtually. Of course, we'll do it again in our sanctuary very soon. But what we have here is a, a time to remember. Jesus said, this, do this in remembrance of me. So when we do this in remembrance of him, we're remembering that he's, he's the, the bread from heaven, that he died on a cross for our sins. We remember that he's our sacrifice. We remember that he's the dowry, that he's the price that, that God paid to purchase us as, as the bride. So we're doing this now. We're celebrating now, but what, people, it's not like the real thing. Wait till we get there. But let's do that for just a moment. Jesus took bread and he divided it amongst his disciples. And we're, for those of you that can, we're going to do that now. He took bread and he said, this, this bread uh, of the new covenant, he said, this, this is the manna that was given from God from above. Take this and eat. He said, this is given for you and this do in remembrance of me. After he did that, Jesus celebrating with his disciples, he pointed out the most important part because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Well, it's no coincidence that the wine in scripture, the Jew, grape juice, is representation, it's a figure of the blood of Jesus Christ. The celebratory part is the fact that Jesus really did pay for us. So without, we can't, we don't have a celebration without Jesus Christ really dying. Not just laying his body on the ground, but life is in the blood. And had he not shed his blood, there is no life. So the next thing Jesus did was he took the cup. And as he took that cup, he gave it to his disciples also. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. People, it's my prayer that in today's message, you've seen some connections between um, what Christ has done in the Old Testament, whether it was the purification uh, with the vessels, whether you've seen that how people, all those things pointed to something more, that the whole Bible is about a work of God in the life of people, and that we have nothing to celebrate lest God has done a work inside of us. Let God do a work in you so that you can have a reason to celebrate, not only now, but most importantly, when the bridegroom sounds the trumpet just outside the city, you'll be ready to be caught up to meet him in the air so he can lead you back to the Father's house. And you will be there in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, when we say, let us celebrate, let us be glad and be thankful for the marriage of the Lamb has come. It's good to be part of the kingdom of God. It's good to be part of Deerbrook Baptist Church. I'm glad you allow me to be your pastor and allow me to preach the gospel and teach the word to you. Uh, I love you very, very much. I miss all of you just dearly. Want to want to hug you all. Can't wait to do that. Uh, Wednesday night, we'll be right here online uh, this way. Next Sunday morning, if you can join us in the sanctuary or you're comfortable uh, joining us in the sanctuary, we're going to be there for worship and teaching. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell them right now, I'll make the announcement that the Sunday school teachers that were teaching before when we were open, if you want to open your classes next week, then, then we'll go ahead and do that too, the ones that were open. So that would be Stacy, and I think Sulane was ready. And uh, So if, if you want to open those classes, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, if you cannot be there or you're still cautious or you have some health risks, please, we understand there's, there's no harm, no foul. Be part of our online community. Next week, Sunday school, I'm sure we'll also be Zoomed. 
Services will be live streamed, so join us there if you can't join us in the sanctuary, all right? Thank you so much for being part of this today. I really love you, and I'm really glad that you, that you want to join us here and get the word out about Jesus. Get ready, because the Marriage Supper of the Lamb is coming soon.